This Filmmaker IQ course is proudly sponsored by HPZ Workstations. Unlimited potential to let you innovate without boundaries. Hi, John Hess from FilmmakerIQ.com and today we're going to go into detail about the techniques we use to pose and animate our Filmmaker IQ mascot and hopefully give you some inspiration to create your own animations. I want to open up with some background on my experience. Now, like most of us, I started experimenting with filmmaking in my mid-teens. But my first little movies didn't involve a camera. They were crude 3D renderings. Like most mid-90s teens, I was into 3D computer games starting to come out at the time, like Seventh Guest and Myst. And I was an avid model builder, so 3D Studio Max was really a perfect fit for me then my skills were never really that good. And then I saw Toy Story. Well, that was the end of that. I wasn't coming close. Even that dancing baby that made it to Ally McBeal was way out of my league. So I put it away and tried live action. I kind of failed at that, so I put that away as well. But the filmmaking bug would never leave me alone. I eventually came back and decided to dedicate my career and eventually my entire life to filmmaking. I was primarily a live action and 2D graphics guy. Uh, seeing more and more 3D capabilities in After Effects over the years, I started to want to get back into doing 3D. So I took the plunge and tackled Maya. I spent six months trying to wrap my brain around that software, but the learning curve was just too steep and I gave up again. So I was never going to be Pixar. Years passed and I kept thinking, one day, one day I'll try again. Well then about a year or so into making course videos for Filmmaker IQ, we began to mess around with 3D Studio Max, this time for the background of our set. That didn't quite work out, but we thought it might be nice to update our course intro with 3D characters. Well, this was a huge undertaking. I had failed learning 3D packages twice, and now we wanted to try character animation. Well, third time's the charm. Through a lot of hard work, it's just started to click. I couldn't have done it without Google. I find myself constantly Googling basic questions and looking up tutorials on YouTube. Now, I bring this up just as an admission that in this regard of filmmaking, I am not an expert. But with help, I am able to apply my expertise from other filmmaking fields. What kept me from tackling 3D CGI was always a fear of failure. I was afraid I wouldn't be as good as Pixar, and I never will be, but I can make something that makes me smile. Watching all those before and after VFX demos, you get the impression that you need to be an expert to do anything in visual effects, but you don't. What kept me away was fear, and if you take anything from what we're about to talk about, I hope it's that you don't need to be afraid of the tool. Just keep trying and keep on learning. So now that I got that off my chest, let's dive into it. When we talk about character animation, one of the biggest hurdles to overcome is constructing the model and rigging your character like a puppet. Well, if you're like me and you don't have the time to learn how to model a character from scratch, and you don't have to, just buy a pre-built model. There's no shame in not building everything in a film from the ground up. Use what's out there, trust me. Professionals buy all kinds of assets for their project. And to me, although modeling can be fun, I really just wanna get in there and animate. In our case, we bought a stick figure from TurboSquid.com that came fully rigged and ready to pose. Now make sure whatever you get will be compatible with your software package. In our case, Autodesk 3D Studio Max. Now, whenever you buy any stock model, it's always good to personalize it and add your own touches. I turned his tie, our signature red, and modeled a mortar board that attached to his head. That was easy, it's just a box and a couple of spheres. The tassel is based on some rope tutorials I saw online and attached to an inverse kinematic bone structure. Again, something you can easily find tutorials for online. Now, I spent a long time trying to figure out how to get, get to hang using 3D Studio Max's mass effects before giving up and just manually animating the hang and the swing. 
Maybe someday I'll go back and redo it, but for now, I'll just fake it. This is just an animation. We're gonna be faking a lot of things. So once I had MacGuffin looking all dapper in the style of Filmmaker IQ, I had to pose him. For this, I used 3D Studio Max's Character Animation Toolkit, or CAT. This is one powerful system and really makes character animation a snap. All you have to do is just grab the bones of the cat figure and position and rotate them however you want. Now, since the figure we bought was rigged for cat, the model itself responds realistically to any changes we make. And this to me is the fun part, creating and animating the pose. Now, I've done a fair bit of art photography where you work with, when you work with human models, you learn a lot about how weight distribution and angles and lenses can affect the way your model looks. And I was able to apply my photography experience in a 3D environment where nothing has weight to begin with. And to help visualize certain poses, I have this artist mannequin, which I use to help get a sense of the angles and views. Now then I will often strike the pose myself and think about which muscles I'm using to create this form and even the muscles that I'm not using. Now here's a little exercise. Hold your hand up and then completely relax your fingers. What shape do your fingers naturally take? When modeling a character in 3D, there's no natural form. So all these shapes, all these curves, have to be designed with purpose. Now one of the final tests to see if a pose conveys the emotion that I want it to have is the silhouette test. Now this is a very old animation technique. If you can tell what the emotion is being conveyed just by the silhouette, now you've got a great pose. If your silhouette is nondescript, then it may be a camera angle issue or the pose is just not quite right. Now I don't always follow this rule, but it can be really helpful for crafting that classic animated pose. Now, speaking of camera angles, lens choice matters, just like in real photography. I will go with a normal to slightly above normal lens. This means shooting in the 50 millimeter and up range. This tends to flatten my character and gets this nice cartoonish proportion to MacGuffin. I don't necessarily like the wide angle look in this, unless I have a very specific reason for it. Now, when it comes down to Animating, I use a mix of keyframing the bones over time and something called pose to pose animation, where you put different poses on different cat layers. I don't have any steadfast rules yet, but I like to keyframe smaller actions and then save the cat layers for an active dramatic beat. Once you get into animation, especially animating with a lot of polygons, things can start getting bogged down. Now, fortunately, I've got this HP ZBook Studio in front of me with its Quadro M1000M video card with four, count them, four gigabytes of video RAM. As you can see, it just chews right through this scene, giving me the instant feedback I need so I can freely experiment with different ideas. Now, for instance, I've got this little dance sequence here. And I, let's say I wanna make a change to his head position. Uh, maybe right around frame 95 or so. Let me just go ahead and select his head bone right there and I can go in a quad view and I can go ahead, maybe I just don't want that cocked as much over to the left there, to the right. Maybe just a little bit there. And I can always move my camera around, just get, make sure that I'm getting that, just that perfect angle. Now with a professional grade card like the Quadro M1000M, I know I'm getting fast and accurate results so I can play around and try different things. But there are times when there's just too much geometry going on. It's just too heavy for the computer to handle. In those situations, what we want to do is simplify the scene. Let's go back into 3D Max here. If I'm working with the character, I don't necessarily care what's going on with that boom mic, or I don't really care what's going on with that movie camera or that production light right there. And so even just by getting rid of that geometry, you can see the animation's already smoother. Now, if you still want more performance, you can always turn back on the Illuminate with default lighting, which makes it even smoother than that. Let's take a look at that. Now, make sure before you render, though, that we bring our friends back, the production light, the movie camera, and the boom light, so that it will actually render out all together. It doesn't matter how good your models are if you don't have good lighting.
Now, when I started professionally working, I was very impressed by grunge and busy edits. Well, over the years, my tastes have changed. Working with my partner, Dennis, at FilmmakerIQ.com, we've adopted minimalism as our style philosophy, and that has creeped into everything I do. So the infinite white background set is where MacGuffin prefers to live. Uh, shooting real photography on white background is really a lot of fun. The bounce light from the background wraps around your subject, creating a very nice, soft feel. This type of shooting is called high key, where you have less contrast between the brights and the darks compared to low key lighting, where you have a big contrast between light and dark. When shooting MacGuffin on an infinite white set, the lighting is actually pretty straightforward. I'll pop up two fairly big area lights on each side of the scene to control both the key and the fill. Now, area lights are perfect for this application because they scatter light and create soft shadows like a softbox on a real set. Now, make sure global illumination is turned on. Global illumination, if you recall from our video on rendering, refers to indirect illumination of a scene, the bouncing of light, which is crucial for that infinite white high key look. Now, often I have to export the character on trans a transparent background, which means I can't use the white infinity wall. To compensate, I'll make sure to change the rendering environment to white and then make sure our area lights are really big so that light really wraps around the character. When I'm working, I always like to check the render, especially to see if the lighting is right. So let's talk render settings. Now we use V-Ray by Chaos Group as our renderer. V-Ray is a very powerful engine for rendering photorealistic lighting. I find it gives MacGuffin and all the gang a very cool miniature look. With V-Ray, there's no one size fits all rendering setting. I've seen lots of great articles on how to best optimize your V-Ray render. For V-Ray image sampling, I have luck using adaptive sampling. In the global illumination tab, I like to have a radiance map as my primary GI engine set to medium setting and light cache with a setting of 1500 subdivisions. V-Ray's official site even states that irradiance map and light cache is probably the best mix of speed and quality. Other techniques like photon mapping take quite a bit of tweaking to get just right and brute force is exactly what it sounds like, a huge time sink. Now you will need to change a few of these settings depending on whether you're going with still or motion picture. Rendering is one of those times where computational power is key. Here, we're rendering a frame from our earlier dance sequence that we we're working on. This HP ZBook Studio with its Intel Xeon E31505M processor actually delivers more punch than my full tower at my edit bay. That's really impressive given such a small and lightweight package. It's like having my workstation wherever I go. Now we could let this computer just power through and just finish off the rest of the frames. But if I'm on a deadline or I've got to use this computer to work on something else, then I would consider sending this animation to a network rendering farm. A rendering farm is a site with a lot of different computers that act as rendering nodes to help you render your scene. They charge you by the gigahertz hour, a few pennies for per gigahertz. And they often have plugins for 3D Studio Max or whatever 3D program you're using to help you upload your assets from your local machine to the rendering farm. Now be careful as costs can add up with these sites, but it's a good way to offload the work from your local machine onto a network of dedicated rendering machines. Now here I've got the files from our rendering farm all 160 frames of this particular animation. This particular scene took about six hours of rendering time. It's six hours distributed rendering time. For us, it, that meant we got in about 20 minutes or so, and it costs just over $2.40. Now, each scene is going to have different rendering times and, of course, different costs. Once I'm satisfied with the image or animation, I'll perform the final render. Now my final use of the file will determine what kind of file I will save it as. If I don't plan on doing a ton of post-processing work, I will save it as either a JPEG or a PNG file if I need to work with transparency or an alpha layer. Then I'll send that file into Adobe Photoshop. 
In this case, I have a pose of MacGuffin that we want to use for our website. What you'll notice is there's no shadow under his feet. I'm sure there's a way to render a real shadow while maintaining transparency, but I find it's much easier and I have much more control to just create a shadow layer under the character using a soft Photoshop brush. I can also go through and adjust color levels and everything else I would normally do with any photograph. If I'm planning on doing some more extensive post-processing work, I will export it as OpenEXR. Now, when you render motion picture, you really want to export a sequence of still images rather than rendering a single compressed file, a sequence of OpenEXR files or JPEGs or PNG files. The workflow is similar to working with raw files. The big advantage of using OpenEXR is the ability to store all kinds of additional maps in your image. The depth map is particularly useful for creating depth of field. Now, 3D Studio Max and V-Ray have excellent depth of field rendering capabilities, but it's time consuming and unforgiving if you make a tiny mistake. With a depth map, we can have After Effects handle the depth of field. Now it's not perfect, but it's quick and it's good enough for adding that camera realism. Open EXR can store many other kinds of maps, everything from specular highlights, reflections, caustics, you name it. All these can be composited and fine tuned without having to do time consuming beauty passes for every minor change. Still, just because it's there doesn't mean you have to use it, but it's good to be aware of all kinds of different tools and approaches which may come in handy to solve a future production problem. So here we have our dance sequence from earlier as a series of images, a series of open EXR files, each with its own depth map. Now between nine and 14 megabytes per frame, this animation can get kind of heavy. Uh, fortunately, the HP ZBook Studio has two HPZ Turbo Drive slots for a maximum of two terabytes of PCIe NVMe storage. But I'm really eyeballing these two extremely fast Thunderbolt 3 connectors, which I can hook up future storage or peripheral devices, especially when I move assets between computers. But let's get back to their animation. We've got this EXR sequence. Let's bring that into Adobe After Effects. Now I've set up the composition already. Now I've extracted the depth map, as you can see here, the darker something is, the farther it is away from the camera. Now using that information, we can use, we can apply camera lens blur and create a little bit of depth of field. Take a look, look carefully at that boom mic right there. As I toggle that effect on and off here, you can see it adds that subtle realism to the shot. It creates a little bit of reality in our depth of field. Now to add some more photorealism, I like to add some motion blur using Real Smart Motion Blur by RE Vision Effects. Let's toggle that sucker on. And you can take a look at his, take a look at MacGuffin's arms as he swings them about there. See how they go in and out of sharpness. They blur as they move about quickly. This is something you can render in 3D Studio Max, but again, like depth of field, it can take a lot of time and you don't have any control over it in the final product. And with that, all MacGuffin needs is a little bit of music and he's ready to party down. I hope I've given you a little taste of how to approach adding CGI to your workflow. I'm still learning myself and there's a vast ocean of things to learn. Just sit through the credits of a modern VFX heavy film. The bulk of the film's credit sequence seems to be just names of digital artists. Now, those guys and gals have lots of training and experience, but that doesn't mean you can't try creating CGI yourself. It may give you a, a whole new perspective as you may find yourself focusing on new things that you may never have thought to focus on before. Well, I'm excited about the prospect of incorporating more and more CGI and digital effects into my work, or at least the option of incorporating those things. I've seen a lot of filmmakers starting out to take a very purist attitude of wanting everything to be real and to get everything in the camera. And to an extent, that is admirable but narrative filmmaking isn't so much about authenticity on the set, but about creating authenticity in the story. So to that end, we should be able to use every tool we can get our hands on, both practical 
and digital. Remember, CGI can only help you figure out how to get the shot, but never why. That's your job as a storyteller, to use the tools as best as you can to go out there and create something great. I'm John Hess, and I'll see you at filmmakeriq.com.